Inside the Birds is back. What's going on, everyone? Jeff Mosher, Adam Kaplan. A lot to cover today, Adam. Got some interesting things uh, going on with the Eagles as their version, the revised version of minicamp carries on. Um, we've had some press conferences that we talked about last podcast. Now we're getting press conferences from players. Some interesting things said by uh, many of the Eagles over the past few days. So we'll we'll break that down a little bit. Uh, we've got some info and intel on what's going on with wide receivers. We're going to talk a little bit about the offensive line, the defense, and get into some some free agency, which is it's hard to believe, right? I mean, that's usually something we say in, in late February and March, but here we are in May, about to turn June, and there's still some significant names in free agency in the trade market that we're going to have to talk about. It's just kind of a wacky year that way. Sure, yeah. Look, uh, we always say it's not about May. It's about September. Free agency goes on through the fall. We'll see. We'll see what happens. Um, you know, the Eagles, uh, you and I have talked about the, the issues with depth, and there's going to be a lot of competition in training camp, no doubt. There's some jobs open. a lot of backup jobs open, my goodness gracious, most they've had in years. And yeah, that'll set up an interesting competition, which, you know, unfortunately, we don't have 7-on-7 seven and 11-on-11. Seven, 11 on 11. That was the trade-off with the players, with the Eagles, with uh, uh, the coaching staff to get them in there. But look, uh, their job's open here, and uh, that's not necessarily a bad thing. Mm -hmm. uh, bring the competition up, as Nick Sirianni, their head coach, has mentioned several times, and he he believes it, and it's been real. Mm -hmm. And uh, we'll see how it shakes out. Who won free agency, by the way? You know how we give the award every year to the team that wins free agency, and then usually they're picking <laughs> in the top five of the draft again <laughs> next year? Well, look. The Eagles know that. Howie yeah, Roseman knows that. Uh, we've seen that before. But who, yeah. so, so let's go, let me ask you, just because sure. it's a fun thing to have. Sure. Who sarcastically won free agency and who do you think actually really won, as in they benefited as a team from, mod from, from good, solid free agent signings? I would say that I like what the Jets did. Now, I know some people think they overpay for Corey, Corey Davis. Is he a true ex receiver, a number one receiver? Mm -hmm. uh, they paid him a lot of money. It's a huge contract. Mm -hmm. uh, I thought they did well there. Carl Lawson, I like that Lawson. addition. Yeah, yep. good, good job there. Player. Yeah, good football right. player, good pass rusher. Uh, I would say they did well with those didn't two signings. All, didn't they also bring in an offensive lineman or a corner? I thought they signed somebody else pretty. Uh, uh, well, they they drafted Vera Tucker, the USC lineman. Right. Elijah Moore, I love that pick, the second-round pick receiver. Yeah, I just thought they had a good offseason. I thought Joe Douglas done a nice job here this offseason. Sure. Oh, Jared Davis. Jared Davis That's is a linebacker. That's the one, right, the linebacker. Yeah. He was yeah. interesting. He came in as a middle linebacker with the Lions, and he just didn't fit their scheme. But he's got good quicks. So they made him a pass rusher, though he's mm -hmm. not the biggest guy in the world. I mean, he's got he's got some sacks, and um, they're th we'll see how they use him. Uh, they're, they're moving to a forty-three front with uh, Robert Sala and Jeff Albrick. Mm -hmm. But uh, that was an interesting signing. I, I, uh, Sheldon Rankins, a former Saints D, uh, D tackle, first That's rounder. That's a pretty good signing for them. Yeah, yeah Vinny Curry. Yeah. yeah, Vinny Curry and Tevin Coleman. They signed, so they they brought in some Tyler Croft, who's had. They did a nice job of also bringing in some low cost, um, you know, one two year type veteran free agents who are not killing their cap space. You know, some of them are, like you mentioned, Corey Davis. But I'm just talking about these other. Their second and third waves, I thought, were pretty smart. Dan Feeney, who started for the Chargers for a little while, right? Bunch, yeah, he, yeah. he he'll be there for competition. So yeah, the, again, they they had. A, crap load of cap space and you know, this has not been joe douglas's calling card to get involved in a free agency but he did mm -hmm. in a big way and um i thought cleveland did some smart things um with um john johnson and troy Good hill Good it's point. interesting i don't know why they rated the, the rams it's kind of weird uh clowny will see how that works out the underrated signing is malik jackson because they are very late i forgot they signed him yeah, yeah that's a good signing yeah um I thought they did a nice job. How about, so. how about Washington? You know, Curtis Samuel gives them yep. some speed. Yeah, um, which is a huge contract. Uh, right. my, my one issue, my one issue, though, the, the, the Patriots, they won free agency. They're the number one team. See, that's the team I think won free agency, but you wonder if all those are going to really work out. Now, right? I, I, the thing that surprised me, a lot of personnel people I spoke to were very complimentary of Belichick. Some of the guys would typically criticize Belichick and find stuff to <laughs> they're jealous. But overall, I said, no, they – they didn't sign a bunch of older players. They signed a lot of guys in the prime of their career. Now, mm -hmm. you want to argue, did they pay Nelson Aguilar a lot? Okay, it's got somewhat of a, a two-year structure. Mm -hmm. 
Um, but they got Trent Brown back. They somehow got David Andrews back. They beat out the, as I understand, the, the Dolphins to, to bring him back. Right. They were to bring back James White. Uh, Matthew Judon, they're paying a ton. Godshaw from the Dolphins. Henry Anderson for the, the Jets. Kyle Vannoy, after he made his $12.5 million, is back. I mean, geez. Hunter Henry and John New yeah. Smith, obviously, crazy. with the tight ends. Um, with Kendrick the Bourne. Yeah, you know, the, they went crazy, but they didn't almost – it seemed like they went crazy with money just on one day. And then the rest were just some yeah. kind of value. Signing, well, so. I mean, geez, they did so much. But what else did they really <laughs> yeah, I know that's a good point. What do they have yeah. left? That'll yeah. be interesting to see how that works out because yeah. it's, there's also, there's the team that just splurges on big name free agents. And then there's also the team like what the Patriots did, which is sign like, you know, a quarter of your roster are free agents. And that can be dangerous at times too. So, um, but yeah, you're right. Washington gave Samuel a lot of money. So there's, but they also, they got what? Did they get Charles Leno? Are they the ones? Yeah, they in? did. And I, I could just tell you from talking to a couple teams that graded him after the uh, Chicago cut him. Yeah. Played poorly last season. Mm-hmm. Um, one team told me that they think that, that um, they're going to need to help Leno and keep a tight end on his side just to help out. That's how much he's, he looks like he's dropped off. Right. And Logan Thomas is not exactly a good blocking tight end. I don't know about John Bates, the fourth rounder um, mm-hmm. from uh, Boise. Mm-hmm. But uh, they they may need help. They may need to help him. Uh, Cosme, their their second rounder, will probably be the, uh, at right tackle. Right. They br- they brought in uh, the corner. They lost Darby, but they brought William Jackson in. I yeah, think, it was, right? could be an upgrade. Great point. Yeah. Yeah. Yep. Not a bad so, signing there. And obviously yeah, they're not great at safety. Quarterback. Got Frank oh, Fitzpatrick. Yep, Fitzpatrick. Yeah. Now that one to me is crazy. I I just cannot believe a they didn't draft a quarterback, and you're not going to bring any competition in for this guy. I mean, really? Well, isn't I, I thought that they were kind of kind of Taylor Heineke uh, the competition because well, Taylor plays so well. Or is it Tyler yeah. or Taylor? Yeah, Taylor Heineke. You're right. It's Scott yeah. Turner's guy. Uh, I, remember I mean, Scott there were people who thought he played well enough to like get the job this year, which I thought was a little. Uh, you know, he's going to be the back. Yeah, there was there's no competition, but they, they gave him a little money to come back. But I remember running to Scott Turner years ago, and he loved that guy. Yeah, Taylor Heineke. He's had him in three spots, and I. Boy, did he play well against the Bucs. If you watch a gutty performance, yeah. Yeah, if you see him throwing the football, you're like, wow, it's awkward, but he gets it there. Well, there you go. All right, so that was interesting. Um, We got a lot to talk about. First of all, you know, Q&A dropped Wednesday morning. They did an hour and a half, and uh, God Mm. bless them. They did – they covered so many subjects. And if you haven't seen it yet, Quentin Michael did an awesome job of breaking down – the defensive fr- what the fourth the, the different types of four three fronts there are you know there's an under front there's an over front there's a stunt or a tilt four three front and he really went into specifically the under and the tilt because it feels like that's you know what you're going to see from the eagles this year because it's kind of a minnesota type of thing to do um and and he went and showed the difference between those fronts which we haven't seen here in philadelphia where you have the the, the Sam linebacker, the strong side backer, in this case, Ryan Kerrigan, either playing right up on the line, uh, right up on the tight end, or walking up if it's a tilt, like kind of starting in one and, and doing the other. So um, I know you've you've talked about it in the past podcast about how they're going to use Kerrigan in a linebacker role a lot. Can't wait. Can't, and yeah, the- Q, Q just ran with that. With, oh. with, he actually had – like, you know how Trey Thomas used to go to the whiteboard in our pregame show? <laughs> Love that. Q, Q Love didn't that. have a whiteboard, but he had already created – the on a white piece of paper that was big enough for the screen all of the diagrams so everybody should check it out and get it get educated oh, on on so what four three fronts are look like and what the eagles are going to do because it was really a good breakdown we'll talk about kerrigan uh, later in the show but yeah th- these guys are these guys are just hammering it it's just been um pure joy bringing in q a and uh kudos to those guys that the fans are mesmerized. They're just, we're all blown away by the education that we're getting. Right. Um, it, it's far surpassed anything we could have, we could have thought of. And uh, of all the, it's funny, Jeff and I put together of some potential player shows about six months ago. <laughs> and I, I think you might've said to me, some of the guys that we know, you might I can't remember who came up with the idea. I think it was you. You said, what about Jason and uh, Q? I'm like, yeah, I, I could see that. Yeah. Um, we had to figure out who would host and Jason's a natural host, but, like you and I, we just need someone to tee up the constant, tee up the question, and they go back and forth. It's just yeah, phenomenal. It, it's been a phenomenal show. I learn something new all the time, and and we can talk about it. We talk about it on this podcast, not just to promote the show, but because it's pretty pertinent to what we do on Inside the Birds, which is try to be educational, try to provide inside intel, and certainly Jason and Q have have done that uh, on their show, and we can piggyback and help each other out and complement each other. Uh, another, one one thing that Jason was talking about with Q 
in their show was Jalen Hurts and his development within this offense and this scheme with a lot of young wide receivers, right? And um, Jason referred to a specific principle called KYP, know your personnel, right? And what he was saying was, you have to know your personnel, not just who they are, but what they do well. And he kind of went into a story about how um, at the Pro Bowl, a lot of the quarterbacks who were at a Pro Bowl once had trouble like getting the ball to Larry Fitzgerald, which is hard <laughs> to imagine. But the point is, Larry doesn't run past people. He's tall, he's lengthy, he uses his body uh, well, and that's why he's a, a Hall of Famer, because he, he can do that at such a rare size. And Kurt Warner had to show people how to throw it to Larry Fitzgerald. Oh. This is all through Jason Vaughn saying, you guys are all trying to throw him the ball down the field. What you have to do is if you're going to throw it down the field, you have to throw it short because then Larry will just turn around, use his body and come up with the ball no matter where you put it, just put it short. And then all of a sudden they start to see all these connections between Kurt and Larry, who are obviously a great uh, you know, quarterback wide receiver combo in, in Arizona. And so the point there uh, Jason was trying to make was, that Jalen Hurts is just now kind of getting to know Devontae Smith, even though he played with him at, at Alabama, and Jalen Rager and some of these other receivers, even though he was on the team last year. It's not just about comfort in timing and accuracy, but it's about knowing each individual's strengths and where they like the ball, right, and their oh, best yeah. tendencies. And both of them felt that – that Jalen Hurts has great leadership qualities and has the chance to be really good. But if, if the development isn't where people hope it's to be people who want, you know, Jalen Hurts to seize control and be the guy it's because he's working with so many young receivers who themselves, Adam, are just, they're trying to figure out their strengths, right? How can Jalen Hurts figure out Devonte Smith's strengths or Greg Ward's strengths or John Hightower's strengths or Jalen Rager's if as young wide receivers, they're still figuring out things that work for them at the pro level because, you know, things work at the college level easily, but now you're at the pro level and it's a whole different game. So it was a really good discussion by them that, you know, we've talked about this whole rhythm and chemistry and, and a timing offense here that Nick Sirianni is going to implement and just some of the obstacles that are going in the way and why it might be slow to start and that you hope it develops along the way. But such a great point that Jalen has, has a lot with his receivers of, of learning and growing to do and not a whole lot of veterans there to kind of help facilitate it. And that's why these practices, I know that they're not doing team stuff. You know, we're talking about 11, 11, seven on seven, but that that's not the point. The point is they're getting time together, getting on the field together. As you said, um, you know, they want to see the, the, their, their spots where they like to have the football. Mm -hmm. Um there's so much. One thing I, as we get into the show that we, what we understand, there's been a ton of teaching. I, because you're, you can't do the team stuff. This is a, these are teachable moments through, through uh, their OTAs. Ta and remember, the big reason is because you have a new coaching staff. They're new to these players. So um, th this is uh, the theme of the offseason is teaching and uh, getting to know each other, as you said. Yeah, yeah. That, that, you know what? There's a, there's a lot of fun in that, honestly. Um, just the newness of the team and some anxiousness, I think, from us and from fans to, to really see how it comes together. And I know from the players – when you heard them speak this week, it does sound like the honeymoon phase. Everybody's kind of loving the new new environment at the NovaCare, as they should, because that kind of newness is cool, people feeling each other out. Uh, most times, obviously with Chip Kelly, it was a little different because he came with kind of a reputation and people were not used to those adjustments. But w when Doug came in, people were uh, people who played for him received him warmly, and certainly that's happening right now. You know, when the season starts and games matter and, you know, you have – fumbles or you have interceptions or you have a stalled third down it kind of sucks that's the part that reality kind of they haven't, they haven't coached the game. game yet right, right. Exactly. they haven't coached the game yet but right. it is it is i think just cool in general to see like the seeds being sown here yeah uh, and then we'll, we'll get to watch it grow for sure and you know the thing that's a little bit disappointing is that unless i'm wrong the media is not getting an opportunity to watch past warmups, right? We're not. Yeah, it's just been ten minutes. We're going to talk about that, that because I, there's been some misconceptions. I, I I don't know. I thought we were. I, I mean, correct me if I'm wrong. Didn't we for years get full OTAs? We could watch everything. Um, I think oh. so. I'd have to go back. I just remember this: that the NFL rules are that the only thing that has to be open to the media for the entire time is mandatory mini camps, and lo and behold. 
the one thing Nick Sirianni negotiated out of this year's offseason oh. was mandatory minicamp. Right. And you start to wonder about point. your your conspiracy theory mind, right? So the wheels start to churn there. Nah, so technically, true. the media does not have to be there. And I'm sure the team, with all the newness, the new schemes, they're not trying to have extra media there. They're not yeah. trying to have reporters, you know, reporting on every little thing that they see. So it works out to their advantage. You, you made me think of something. Uh, G- Jim Harbaugh, former Niners head, head coach, he had a disdain for the media watching training camp practices. So it, it, the Niners complex in Santa Clara, mm-hmm. they had maybe three fields. He purposely, I believe, this is what some of the local media would say, he would have the practice over the far fields so the media couldn't watch. Like they couldn't, <laughs> they were, you couldn't. You're only allowed to go to Chip certain did places. Chip that a little bit. Chip did, that, on the, Chip did that at the Novacare where he would have he? the main team. I mean, obviously, when you're divided up, you have to use all the fields. But when he went full team on team, he would use the furthest field. Oh, uh, okay. I, I, yeah, Wow. Did he really? Okay. Yeah. Now, we were allowed to walk around the perimeter. Yeah, the perimeter, so yeah. you could get to that. You're still not getting a great angle. If they're on one side, remember, if you're walking around the perimeter and the field itself ends, like the, the, the other side of the field ends halfway – between you know the field and and the rest of the fields then you can't go on that side so you can only go around one side and he could have the the offense and defense on the other side of the football field so they Mm -hmm. all they all they all listen (laughs) we're in their heads rent free sometimes but you understand why well they they gotta be secrety and covert right and the one it'll be funny i'm sure he won't do it but uh and i don't think peterson did, did it you could correct me if i'm wrong here but Remember the Andy Reid rule? You couldn't sit down and practice? Yeah. Or you couldn't lean it. The, the thing would get me. So for folks, if you've ever been to Novacare, if you ever watched a practice or whatever, if you've ever seen the, the, the video, when Andy Reid was the head coach, you were not allowed to lean on um, a railing, the, 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 the uh, concrete seats. Mm-hmm. You couldn't sit down there. But if you did either sit down or leaned on the railing, uh, the PR people would say, "Uh, uh-uh, uh, get up or move." They wouldn't let you do that, and mm-hmm. which is, it would give because it would give the belief that you're being lazy and stuff like that at practice. Although we're not players, we're just media, right? And I, that used to kill me. I mean, sometimes I don't know how Andy would see it. I would see him point oh. and have the PR people <laughs> come get us. He saw every that guy had. I'm, I was convinced Andy Reid had eyes not only in the back of Hawk his guy. head but on his calves. On his arms, he had eyes everywhere. He saw everything. You know what's funny? You just, as you said that, it just I, it's really funny how you'll say something triggers a, a memory. Uh-huh. And you'll love this. It would just kill me. It could be it could be December and 25 degrees out, and it's snowing, and they're inside in the uh the bubble. Uh-huh. And he's and he's wearing shorts. Oh god, yeah. Oh yeah. And you just see that said, guy. Oh, He's he's shorts in the middle of winter guy, which, by the way, I had a little bit of a reputation for being when I was at Penn State as well. I don't know why, but I I just I like shorts more than pants. I I do. Oh, yeah. You know, I I don't get like when the fall comes, I probably won't start wearing jeans until November. You know, if if it's 50 degrees, I'll still I'll rock the shorts for as long as I can. I can tolerate it. But Andy's on a whole other level. He's he's just crazy. I'm like, what? Because we got polar bear blood, man. (laughs) <laughs> he does. We would go into the practice bubble with jackets on because it's cold. And by the way, there's no heat. There's no, is there, was there heater? There was no heat in there, that thing, was there? In the bubble? No, no. Nah, nah, I mean, if it was, it was minimal. No, they don't, right. you can't and pump heat into a bubble. You're going to have to pay a lot of money. Right. <laughs> right. And that's why, that's why I'm like, what is Andy doing? We would yeah. just laugh anyway. Yeah. No, he was, he was fanatical about it. Um, by the way, you're, the steps you're referring to at the Novacare complex that you were not allowed to sit on. When I got on the beat, I would, uh, you know, I naturally asked, well, you know, what's the deal? And I was told it's, they're not steps, they're architecture. So that, that was supposed to be the message to get you to not sit on. I did not you know that. that. Yeah. Really? That's how it was related to me. Well, it's, okay. they don't call it steps. It's called architecture. But funny when, when Chip Kelly came over, he let the media sit on the steps and nobody said anything about us, you know, uh, corrupting the architecture. Great point. Great point. Just funny how that happens. You All never right. know what you're going to learn. Right no, now. you never, never know. And speaking of that, Adam, uh, we had a great conversation with Memphis football head coach Ryan Silverfield. It's on our Inside the Birds uh, ITB TV on our YouTube. So check it out. You could tell that Ryan believes that um, two things. One, that if Gainwell had played last year, um, some of the areas that he needs to improve on, like pass protection and between tackles running, would have been more advanced at this point. And because he would have been – 
a focal point of Memphis's offense had he played last year and not opted out. And then the number two, that parlays to number two, you can tell he thinks he thinks Gainwell is going to be a really good player in the NFL. Yeah, it, correct me if I'm wrong. Did he talk about Sanders and Gainwell in the backfield together? He said something about that they could do some – yeah, really like pony things. package type things. Yeah, that's it. Right, yeah. right. So, yeah, and he, what I loved about it, and I, I, I didn't even know this. Um, I mean, we, you and I, and our listeners know about Tony Pollard of Dallas, and here's a funny story by Tony Pollard. Tony Pollard, when scouts were going to Memphis, it was not the guy that they pushed um, from that. For whenever Pollard came out uh, two years ago, mm-hmm. they would just go over the roster, you know, because they give him a sheet. Here are the guys you should know about. Right. They didn't really talk Pollard up, and he's been a really good backup running back. It was probably Henderson that they were looking right, at, right? Exactly. Daryl Henderson was a third round pick of the Rams. He's been a did a good job, started a bunch of games last season. Though Cam Akers is their starter. Mm-hmm. Um, obviously, Gainwell now, and then uh, Gibson. He tells a funny story. I don't want to give it away, but wait to hear how he talks about uh, Antonio Gibson. He kind of, kind of caught me by surprise the way he described him when they got him at Memphis. Yeah. And very then. Much so. I was not even aware of this guy, Patrick Taylor, who was an undrafted running back for the Packers last season. Oh, okay. Yeah, that, that name slipped me. I'm telling you, Memphis has put some players out there. Mm-hmm. I mean, Don Terry Poe. Yeah. I know Paxton Lynch did not do very well in the NFL, no. but he was a first-round pick. Um, the wide receiver for the Bears, Anthony Miller. Yes, right. second rounder who unfortunately has not worked out very well. They tried to move him during the draft. Yeah. I mean, he's got um, some talent. Though. He can play at this level. Yeah, he's he got to stay healthy yeah. and be more consistent. But yeah, yeah for Memphis, no. you're, you're happy about that. You're saying, hey, yeah, we, look, we got a guy in the NFL. Hey, uh, Nor- Norville, the former head coach in Silverfield, have built a pretty good program there in Memphis. They, uh, it's not easy because when I was growing up, for those of you over 50, remember this guy, Keith Lee and the basketball team in the mid 80s. Mm-hmm. Uh, they were dominant, man. Um, Memphis was a basketball school, never really known for football. And then you had in the 2000s, D'Angelo Williams uh, was there. Randy Feekner, the former yep. OC of the Steelers, yep. was the OC at uh, Memphis. And and uh, now you got uh, – they, they're like running back you, as you called them on the, on the interview. I, I, I called funny. them dual threat running back you. Yeah, yeah like right, Tony right. Gibson oh, and Pollard. And- <laughs> talks about that. Right. Listen to Silverfield really outline what, what they asked the running backs to do. And, uh, again, I don't want to give it away, but – Really a learning experience. I'm really glad that he uh, was willing to do it. By the way, when I was a kid, I was a huge fan of Memphis back when it was called Memphis State. Memphis State, because right, right. I was the biggest Penny Hardaway fan uh, yep. you'd ever seen. I don't know why. I mean, because I love basketball. I love, but I'm not, obviously not from Memphis. And I just, you know, I loved college basketball a lot more in the 90s than I do now. And the best games that I, that weren't Big East games, I love the Big East, but. Um, when Memphis played Cincinnati, you would get Penny Hardaway versus Nick the Quick Van Exel, and they would just take turns lighting it up. And those Penny were Martin? unbelievable. No, I, Nick Van Exel came even before that. Okay. Yeah. Yeah. Kenyon, Man, I mean, he Kenyon could... eventually got there. But um, yeah, Nick Van Exel versus Penny was, I guess that's Conference USA at the point, at that point, right? Ruben Patterson at UC? Was he there? Yeah, he's a Cincinnati guy. Yeah, yeah definitely. Yeah, I definitely. know my hoops, man. But uh, um, Nick Van Exel was fun to watch too. He was, was a lefty, a man. He, big Penny fan. I, he, Penny was, Penny got robbed by injuries, unfortunately. Now he's a, is he, he's their coach, right? Yeah, he's their coach. Yeah, pretty cool, man. Pretty yeah, cool. So definitely love that. Um, we were able to get that done. Um, I've got a couple more ideas uh, for guests that we've never talked to before on our show. So we'll uh, we'll examine those coming. Definitely, up. definitely. That's that's our first college football head coach to uh, be on ITB TV. So I was I was proud of that. That's a good good. You know, I mean, this is a, a, success, a successful coach. So that was that was nice of him to join us. I pre- shout out to uh, Ryan Silverfield uh, for joining us on there. For sure. Uh, all right, let's get into the pod first. Don't be a loser. Stop paying full retail price. We tell you this all the time. For the things you want and need, get on Deal Dash. Go to Deal Dash. Dot com or download the app when you register you enter the promo code itb you'll get a special offer for some bonus free bids everybody should get bonus free bids just use the promo code itb at when you register at deal dash.com or download the deal dash app all right let's start off talking about otas uh, i want to address what I think is a misconception now. And that happens sometimes guys come out and say things and, and they get a little bit taken out of, out of context. Let's start with Jalen Rager, uh, who was very candid in his press conference, uh, a zoom conference about a lot of things. Uh, One of them just being his determination to prove a lot of people wrong this year. And the other being his role, which, you know, he mentioned he was going to play the slot. 
Um, and right away, people were like, whoa, you're moving to the slot. But he also said, you've got to be interchangeable. And all of the receivers, Adam, he said, are going to learn all of the roles. But, you know, the fact that he mentioned he was going to be moved into the slot made people think that this is kind of his new home. He is going to be a slot receiver. And it's not, it's my understanding that that's not the case. I mean, he's, he's going to play all the positions. There will be times, as I understand it, he will be in the slot. Now, he'll probably be in the slot more this coming year than he was last year. But I want to remind people, we, you and I did a podcast last year, probably in February or March, where we had some pretty good intel on how Jalen Rager was going to be used. Yeah, by it was, Doug Fe- it was a couple months ago. Yeah, right. Sure. In fact, the title of the pod was "The Plan for Jalen Rager," and it wound up being a very oh, last year you mean last, last year? year. Yes, oh, no, yeah, last yeah, yeah. year. Yeah, yeah, it's true. It's and true. what we outlined in that pod was that Doug Peterson and his staff wanted to put Jalen Rager in the slot along with outside because they wanted to capitalize on his ability to create in space over the middle. Remember, this guy is built like a running back. You know, he's not, you know, a 160, 70-pound wide receiver. He's got some muscle to him, which we'll get into in a little bit uh, also. So while while I think that this coaching staff is going to use do that even more, right, it's not new, the concept of putting Jalen Rager in a lot of different positions. Um, Last year – we were told that they wanted to use him on jet motion, jet sweeps, and do all sorts of things. But as we know, last year the playbook had to get ripped up about two weeks into the season. Jalen himself got hurt, so they couldn't do everything they wanted to do. So I don't know that the philosophy of what this staff is going to do with Jalen Hurts is a lot different than what the staff last year had planned to do with Jalen Hurts, but they didn't. I mean, I'm sorry, not Jalen Hurts, Jalen Rager. Yeah. But they didn't do it last year, even when he was healthy they wound up not doing it. Yeah. Um, it, it, this year, the plan, <laughs> again, yeah. right now, is to feature him in a variety of ways. I agree. Including yeah. the outside and the slot. Well, if you recall, I don't know, two or three months ago, was when we first started getting intel, we had heard, and people didn't quote me right. I didn't say Rager's moving to the slot. I right. said they use him in the slot. Some of these young bloggers and Instagram news hounds, they didn't quote me correctly, and I, I went after one guy privately. I said, dude, I never said that. Why don't you at least get the go back and listen to it, at least get it right. I'll be happy to – if you want to call me, call – I told the guy, one guy, he could call me if he wanted to. Sure. The guy didn't take me up on it. But Jeff's right. They're, 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 he, Jalen Rager will not be a static player, which means stay in the same place. They're going to move him. Whether he's a Z, um, slot, who knows, running back, whatever they want to do. This is the kind of stuff that he did at TCU – and which we were expecting last year, but the, the two injuries kind of set him back. And plus, this this coach, the staff, both sides of the football, but in offense, they they just couldn't get it going. I, I, they struggled. Uh, play calling wasn't great. This was a this was a meltdown by their, their coaching staff on offense. They just didn't. Uh, we, we outlined this out of fifty times last year. This was uh, right. This is this is not a good job by them last year. They where I think they had been better years before, mm-hmm. but. Okay, Rager got hurt. Now he's healthy, and um, I'm, I, I can, he's another guy. I cannot wait to see how they use him. I'm, I do want to add this. Um, from what I've heard, they, they're they big on matchups. They're big on taking advantage of the talent for each player. They're not – we know kind of offense they're going to run, more of a West Coast old school mm-hmm. than the – a little different than Doug Peterson's. But they're big, A, on matchups, B, taking advantage of the talent that each player is given. So, as you were saying on Rager – they're gonna they're gonna move him around, take advantage of it. Um, they're gonna take advantage advantage of Goddard as a move tight end, though That's he right. could do everything, you know. Right. So right. I look forward to. This. I, I I'm I know they haven't coached the game yet, and this is only May. We don't want to go crazy here, but just the stuff that I've heard from various sources on this the staff, mm-hmm. very encouraged, uh, particularly in offense, and obviously the D coordinator Gannon, who we've now talked about for three months, who um, really has gotten off to a good start as well. Sure. Um, also to add to what you're saying, right? There was some video that came out of practice on Tuesday, I believe, where okay. maybe you saw it, um, where Jalen w- Rager was working with the running backs, kind of taking end arounds from Joe. Oh, Flacco I didn't see that. No. At that uh-huh. point. Yeah. Uh-huh. And some of the reporters noted that d- while they were allowed to watch the wide receivers were working out in one area and Jalen Rager was working in another area. And it led to some thinking like, wow, they're really going to feature him 
prominently maybe in that Jeff Sweet role or, you know, line them up in the backfield. Again, things that the last staff said or, or projected and planned to do just didn't do enough of. Uh, it is true. That happened. But what I can tell you is I was told that after 10, 10 or 15 minutes later, when they went to a different period, it was Devontae Smith who then went to work out uh -huh. with the running backs, okay. doing the same thing. And then Rager went to work with the wide receivers. So if, if there was some messaging out there that Jalen Rager did an entire day of practicing without the wide receivers, oh. that's not correct. And if it's okay. out there that Devontae Smith is only, you know, didn't do things that Jalen Rager did, that that's not correct. So I'll be interested. That's interesting. So I, you know, later today on Thursday, I, I'll, you know, I, we'll see what the, these reporters tweet out. But again, they're only, they only watch warmups, right? 10 minutes. I mean, the first 10 minutes are usually just warm-ups and individual stuff. Yeah. Right. Right. So, uh, we'll, which we'll is see. warm ups, individual drills. Right. Exactly. Right. So, uh, I'm, I'm glad that the staff, basically when you and I are hearing, and we've pretty much heard this since they, they got here in, um, in, you know, January and February, mm -hmm. that this is their big on player development. And I mean, we, you know, one of these, in our June shows, we'll start looking at, um, what's kind of happened with the lack of player development. It, it because as you and I have been saying for, for months now, and I think it's very fair, if this group cannot develop these receivers, and how about what Rager was talking about, how uh, he loved it that these guys are really hyper-focused, the, the staff, obviously, with uh, Sirianni, a receiver guy, Petulo, a receiver guy, mm -hmm. obviously Aaron Moorhead, a former NFL receiver. As we've been saying, if these guys can't develop these guys, then the, the personal staff clearly missed on these players. Yep. I would totally agree with you. Um, so I think this has got to be the one area that. So I'll, I'll, if you're if you're in the skeptical camp, right, if you're in the I don't think the Eagles are much better in you know, five, six wins camp, you're at least excited, I would think, about wanting to see some real good development of what you want. You want to see Devontae Smith out there starting, catching balls. And by the way, I mean, the praise from Nick Sirianni was, I thought, pretty tangible. I mean, he, he mentioned that he caught everything. Uh, you don't have to say that in that he, he brings a presence. I think he, he used that word, right? He brings a presence to the wide receiver group, which I think is, ba is, is badly needed. You know, someone who has that kind of, we talked about that Alabama pedigree of every day is business. Like you heard Jalen Hurts say, rent's due every day and I don't plan to miss a payment. That's the kind of mentality they also need at wide receiver. Yeah, I the, so so what I had heard is um, from the very first practice, even at rookie camp, mm -hmm. and you were just alluded to it. There's just something different about him that they have not had in the room, and what it's going to do is going to make Jalen Rager more competitive because when he sees Jalen Devonte Smith dominating the practice, he's not going to fall behind. This is what Sirianni wants with competition. Right. Oh, you just did this. Well, I can do this. Yeah. Obviously, you stay within your role. You don't do more than you're supposed to, but. You tack the football. You know, that's – Devontae Smith attacks the football as a receiver. That you, you, you run the right route and you attack it and you grab it and you run after the catch, which is, by the way, going to be big in this offense. So I know they're super young, maybe too young at receiver, but it's not a bad thing. It's you not do a wish... bad thing if, if, you're, if your youth is talented, right? Yes, and they are – look, Rager is very gifted. Yes. Uh, Smith is super gifted. Fulgham uh, – you know, we, we – there's a couple of things we didn't talk about in our last show where we, we – we, there was a positional uh, show in addition to talk about the, the coordinators. Mm -hmm. We, we talked about Fulgham. Um, you know, the last staff didn't move him. Greg Cosell told me that they did use him as a, not only an X, but they played him in the slot too. Mm -hmm. I, I believe that'll probably happen here though. I, I, my senses will be more of the X. No. What, he needs to be more consistent. You and I have outlined this now for the she's uh, six months. <laughs> <laughs> Going back to last October was basically the, the, the good stuff, but we started to hear stuff about a little bit of immaturity. Right. So he's not given – look, he'll be on the team, but he's not promised any kind of role. We'll see. So I'm glad you brought up immaturity because we've kind of harped on this about the wide receiver group for maybe, maybe six months, right? Um, and we got some questions or at least comments on YouTube ex explaining what exactly we mean. And on, and. I think let's let's clarify because immaturity can be any number of things. You know, you might look at a guy just goofing off and not paying attention and say that guy's really immature. But I don't know that that's necessarily the case for all the wide receivers we're talking about that they're goofy yeah. Yeah. or they're not paying attention or they think 
maturity can be simply defined as, you know, you're an NFL player. It is your job every single day to show up to work, being ready to have a presence, being ready to accept your coaching, being ready to get better every single day. And if you're not following that regimen, if you're allowing yourself to just kind of go through the motions, if you're not living and dying football when you're in the confines of the Novacare every single day compared to somebody who is like a Brian Dawkins or somebody else. I, I mean, I, I'm using an extreme there, but that's an example of needing to mature. You need to understand you're a professional and you have duties to perform. And when things aren't going well, you have to keep your head up. You have to stay positive. You can't get lost in, in what about me? All those things factor into maturity. So when we talk about maturity with, you know, whether it's Jalen Rager or John Hightower or Quez Watkins or whoever, they're not all the same, right? I mean, that, what I'm saying, we, we need this, what the Eagles need is these guys to grow up and mature and understand uh, that every snap they're playing in practice, they should treat like it's their last snap. Right. The, 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 what's been mentioned to me repeatedly is attention to detail, finer points, making sure you carry out your assignment correctly. Mm-hmm. And it's not just route running. It's every part of the route. It's every every time you come into practice, which is you're alluding to here. Mm-hmm. Um, understand you're an NFL player now. Your your college career is over. Now there were this was not a secret. Watkins and Hightower, it's, it's pretty significant issues uh, mm-hmm. coming out in terms of maturity. Uh, Watkins is a more talented player than Hightower, but a guy like him, from a talent standpoint, should have gone in the third round. There's a reason why he dropped to the sixth. Mm-hmm. So that that's there, the there issue you go. with maturity. Yeah. So so let's let's talk about it in another way. Let's talk about with Jalen Rager last year, right? Um, he he's not immature in the sense where he does he he's a, a kid who's just not taking his craft. Uh, you know, like he, he's out there just goofing off. I mean, this is a kid who hurt himself making a tackle on an interception in training camp. That that ordinarily falls under the category of hustle, you know, yeah. and determination. This kid is a determined player. You've, I was there. Yeah, I mean, you've, I, you've heard I him talk, the, right? Go ahead. I'm sorry. You know, I was just going to say, I was at that practice and it was an interception and he tried to, it was at um, the link mm-hmm. and he tried to stop the play. You know, you're just, you, you, you don't stand there. You try to stop it, the interception. And he reached and um, this is the shoulder injury, right? This was the yes. That's injury. where he hurt his shoulder, a little piece of his labrum. Right. And yeah, I mean, he was, you're exactly right. It was a hustle right. play. So he did the right thing. And then he, then he, right. uh, would he break his thumb after that? Later? Right. Making a catch. I think it was against the, in the Bengals game. Yeah. yeah going over home. The middle. Right. right. How, however, to be fair to, to the Eagles and to really show you the example of what happened last year, he was also not at the weight he was supposed to play at right. last year. Uh, and because of that, he was fined. Uh, I was told a couple of times. And mm. so now when people hear that, they get one concept of, oh, well, that's very immature. It wasn't like he was, it, he was not overweight because he was out eating cheesesteaks. Okay. This was not like a situation where he just let himself go yeah. because he's a millionaire. What happens is he, the way he works out, he adds weight, his body adds weight in a specific, when he works out a specific way, he shouldn't have been doing the, that type of workout. In fact, if you remember at the combine, he ran a slower 40 than what he clocked at TCU because of uh, added bulk, right, from from working out a certain way. And as soon as he ran that 40, if you remember, he, he slimmed back down, they went back, and he started running his normal, you know, 4-3 or whatever it was back, back in Texas. So um, that was the case last year. And it's not like he doesn't take football seriously, but you have to take your correct workout regimen seriously and make sure that you reach your – uh, your expect- expected weight. Trey Thomas has talked to us about that. He, as, oh. a, as a rookie, was, what do you say, Andy Reid, find him like six, seven thousand dollars something lot. crazy. Maybe it was yeah. even more than that. Fifth, right. Maybe it was even in the tens of thousands. I think it was. And yeah. It might have been like 30 grand or something. And what did he, he had a funny line. He said, that's how much I made. I can't remember what he said. He so 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 pretty funny. Right. I mean, this guy's a three-time Pro Bowler. I mean, you wouldn't yeah. say he didn't take his craft seriously. It's just that as a rookie, as a young guy, he had to learn the right things to do in the right way. And so that, that was Jalen Rager's kind of learning experience last year. Uh, I told he's, I'm told he's around, you know, at good weight this year, I think 190, 191, two, something like that. Okay. Which is, which is better for him. What, what and, I understand and that should be good for his explosion. Right. What I understand about Rager, he was very heavy at the combine. He was over 200 right. between 203 and 206. Mm-hmm. What happened is he changed 
uh, trainers somewhere around the combine, maybe it's a couple weeks before. And the guy, for some reason, just maybe as you were talking about lifting, whatever, he put on weight and there was a little bit of a red flag. People, teams were like, wait, he should be 195 ish. I know mm-hmm. he's jacked up. He's a very strong guy, right? For, for guys, you know, not, not exactly six feet, he's short, a couple inches shorter than that. Um, he's just over five foot 10. But yeah, if he plays in the low one, he's fine. That's good. I, I don't worry about him. I just, I just want to see him use the correct way, A, stay healthy, yep, and be the guy that the Eagles saw on tape. Because, man, and the other thing is, we haven't talked about this enough. He better return punch this season. He was dynamic as a, in his final season at TCU. I don't get that. Yeah, no, I agree with you. That's supposed to be part well, of what made him a first-round pick, is that you're not yeah. just getting a wide receiver. You're getting a guy who could break a return, which he did do, by the way, 71 oh, yards. that's right. Against, against Green Packers, Bay. Right? Yeah. 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 Um, is that the same game he also took a – he one of the very few times Doug put the ball in his hands as a running back and gave him an end around, and I think he went 30-something yards on that? If that sounds correct. I think this is just a kid who needs, like, uh, you know, as you just mentioned, he needs to get the ball in his hand like six, seven, eight times in a game and not having – not within a dysfunctional offense just so he can – like the dam can break for him. Like he can feel what it's like to be a featured part of an offense and put his ex- – speed and explosion on display and then i think it'll be fine be- because you can tell he's very very deterred just watch his press conferences he knows mm-hmm. what's being said about him he knows what, what just, the whole justin jefferson thing i wish he would just not stop. worry about it exactly, exactly. But, but some of the best athletes you know oh look i'm not gonna i'm gonna make a very loose and bad analogy but it, it worked for this guy right when, if you ever saw the, the the ESPN documentary on Michael Jordan, he took everything personally. Oh, yes. Okay, yes. so I'm Every not slight. saying Jalen Rager is going to be Michael Jordan. I'm just saying if you're going to be that determined, use it positively. You, you know, drive you. Make sure you're yeah. pro- perfectionist in what you're doing. Don't let it consume you, though, off the field and on Twitter or anything like that. I hope Brandon Graham talks to Rager because, Bre- as, you, as you know, he – this was in the infancy of social media in 2010, 2011, and 2012. Mm-hmm. Graham had some real issues with fans on Twitter. They crushed him for JPP. Yeah, he, he went was on a blocking up. spree. Right, right. Yeah, and he blocked me. I never even met the guy. <laughs> he should have been converted to offensive lineman. He was blocking so well that year, man. <laughs> so, I mean, he blocked everyone. And he, look, and, you know, obviously Brandon's going to be an Eagles Hall of Famer. It's, it's turned out to be a good story. They're all Thomas, obviously. I get it, folks. Um but he turned his career around where – now, the Rager's only played one year and he had a couple of injuries, but mm-hmm. a, a Graham tore his ACL, didn't he? What, first or second year? Like that? He did tear his ACL, yep. Yeah. Yep, second so, year. And, 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 yeah, and he didn't – he got off to a bad start. There there were he – he, he had maturity issues, and then he turned his life and career around. He was unbelievable. And he's been – I mean, you're talking about Eagles Hall of Famer someday. Um, mm-hmm. One of Howie Rosen's best draft picks in 2010 is actually Howie's first year's uh, GM after Tom right. Heckert left. right. And uh, look, it's we'll see. I'm, I'm pretty bullish on Rager, and I, I'm pretty bullish on this offensive staff. But again, we have to temper it. They've not coached a game yet. This all this all means nothing until they, they actually actually play games. But at least everything we're hearing is positive. Absolutely, 100. percent All right, we have some other elements of the team we want to get into from an OTA vantage point. First, I want to remind everybody, and I don't think I need to remind Sixers fans that it's playoff time. We've got big stakes, bigger promotions. DraftKings Sportsbook has put you courtside with a chance to turn $5 into $200. That's 40 to 1 odds on any basketball game. And all you got to do is pick any team that's still in the hunt for the trophy. And if that team wins, you receive $200 in free credits. That's right. You pick any team still in contention, bet $5. And if that team wins, you cash in $200 in free credits. All it takes to claim these 40 to 1 odds on the basketball team of your choosing is placing a $5 bet on that team and that team to win. So that's a pretty good deal right there. So don't forget, Sports, DraftKings Sportsbook also offers great odds and promotions on baseball, hockey, and so much more all week long. DraftKings is secure, safe, and reliable, so you can deposit and withdraw your funds at your convenience. So download the top-rated DraftKings Sportsbook app now. Use the promo code ITV when you sign up to turn $5 into $200 in free credits. Bet on the basketball team of your choice to win their next game. And if they do, you can claim $200 in free credits. That's promo code ITV for a limited time only at DraftKings Sportsbook. You got to be 21 or older, Pennsylvania only, new customers of 
uh, only. Wager paid out in site credits. Restrictions apply in partnership with Meadows Racetrack and Casino. See DraftKings.com slash Sportsbook for details. Gambling problem? Call 1-800-GAMBLER. Pretty big win Wednesday night, by the way. That was, oh, yeah. Uh, the Sixers. I, I'm so nice glad. And and I'm sorry? Nice and convincing. That's, yep. that's what and I, I like lo- to see. And that's why MB didn't play in the fourth quarter. That's huge. And I just, it made me laugh. And I know why they're doing it because they, they, they're going with a three guard offense. When the other team is bigger, it's going to be hard to compete. It's just going to be hard. And putting yep. Raul, Raul Neto, I mean, <laughs> I know they, familiar friend Raul Neto. <laughs> yeah. I mean, former Sixer, another one, Ish Smith being the other one. Boy, he could move. He, he pushes the pace. But that's why do you think, I mean, talk of, Tobias Harris it's had obviously a very good year. Mm-hmm. The, the Washington, they don't, it's like they can't even remotely cover the guy because they're too small. He just goes right by, he just goes right by these guys. It's a, what I would go is with Gafford, who I absolutely love, Daniel, unless you follow the good NBA. Athlete part, there, yeah. Yeah. The backup center is super athletic, came over from Chicago. Yeah. I would go with him at Power Ford and give the Sixers something to think about. Now, I know that. Sixers could do some other things to counteract that, but they have no chance. I mean, I I still thought I I picked the Sixers in five. I'm would shock me if Washington won a game in in Washington, but um, it's good to see. As you said, it's it's good to see them get off to a good start. Yep. Unfortunate what happened to Westbrook. I think that's the, I hate seeing that. Yeah. It gives the city a bad name because of of the reputation. And I just I really can never tell what I was never that type of fan. I I don't even think I heckled. Right? I, you I boo? Just, you never booed? I, I, boo, I booed collectively. I, did. <laughs> I didn't boo individuals. I booed teams. You know, you co- a team comes running out, boo. Or eh, maybe I booed a few star players when they were announced to the plate or or over the, you know, if they scored a bucket. and la- But I didn't like, I, I don't know. I just didn't shout obscenities. I didn't throw things. I, I just, I, I, what, what? Well, I don't know what compels somebody to throw popcorn never f- at, a, at a player. I never like throw anything. Yeah, I – when I was growing up, this is how old I am. I, do you know who Greg Luzinski is? I'm sure you, you Of the course. Bulls. Yeah, yeah. I'll Greg the Bull. Yeah. So, so my dad, this is probably late 70s, early 80s. And I remember them saying some stuff, which was really foul. And I asked my dad what I was too young to understand what it meant. <laughs> he didn't want to explain it to me. He just said, don't worry about it. <laughs> I mean, that was, and we were sitting. I, it's funny, at the vet, we sat 600 level. <laughs> and... As you, you you well know about the 700 level for the Eagles. And I would always tell friends, if you're going to sit there and you're not an Eagles fan, do not wear the jersey of the opponent. Yeah. I know you feel like you could do whatever you want. It's your life. <laughs> but I'm telling you, it could be very ugly for you. I'm not – I'm just warning you. Just mm-hmm. be careful. Yeah. You know? Yeah, just I, – listen, I, I don't even mind razzing fans. Just, you know, I don't – the whole, like, just cursing somebody out. And I know half the people are drunk when they did, do did, that. Did but... you see what – and, and then uh, Velasquez, right? <laughs> <laughs> you know that story. Vince? This week with a fan heckling him where they say, oh, you're a high school pitcher. Oh, yeah, yeah. I thought yeah. it was funny. Yeah. Did you ever see Deuce Bigelow? You know, I've never seen. I heard it's with Rob. What's his it, name, Rob? Yeah, it looks like a, a Rob Schneider. It looks yeah. like it's a terrible, stupid, you know, yeah, movie yeah. in those yeah. in that chain of the Adam Sandler movies that came out, even though he's not in it. I don't but, get um, him at all. I just don't understand. But I tell you, the one the one scene where I I was just cracking up, I could not contain myself, was when Deuce brings this woman to a he 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 brings a woman to a baseball game, and she's supposed to have Tourette's syndrome. Oh, and she screams out things that are obscene and he figures out a way to convince everybody around him that what she's saying is not what they heard <laughs> <laughs> and he, he and what he convinces them that she's actually talking sports like <laughs> she screams out like she's just sitting there and she screams out like ball hair and he goes yeah we need a strike here <laughs> oh, that's so great that's so, that rem- um on seinfeld oh. when for those of you who know Seinfeld, you'll remember with the um, Hampton, the Hamptons episode. Oh yeah, when it was an ugly baby. What an ugly baby! Oh, what a gotta snuggly baby! baby. <laughs> right, you got it. Right, you got it. Exactly right. Love it. All right, uh, let's get back to football. Yep. The offensive line, Adam. Um, yeah. Wh- wh- I mean, Brandon Brooks being back is really, really positive sight. I mean, he he looks like a totally different remade person. He weighed at camp. I'm told uh, between three hundred five and three ten. He looks. He's. I, I totally forgot. I know. I know he practiced technically. He didn't play in week seventeen. Mm-hmm. So yeah, he's look. I mean, he's the greatest guy. What a uh, he's had to overcome. Obviously, the challenges. Um, sure. And anxiety. Um, of anxiety, and he's uh, 
I, I don't usually root for players, but I root for him. Yeah, he's and, the one to root for. Yeah, great, great dude. And uh, I know him and Lane Johnson are very close. Lane, by the way, uh-huh. we, we had the note uh, six, eight weeks ago that his ankle was – he was doing great from the surgery, and he is. He's – everything they allow him to do, he's doing great with. So let's get into it. I mean, mm-hmm. Kelsey's back, and I, I still think it's a long shot if he comes back next year based on what I know. Mm-hmm. And as we noted a couple of weeks ago, he's got this poison pill in his contract for next year. It's like a, I don't know how the hell they came up with this. Someone did. Uh, it's a $30 million roster bonus next year. Mm-hmm. It's non-guaranteed, but uh, obviously they have, if he, if he, he shocks us and wants to play next season and come back to Philly, where I'm sure that's the only team he'd play for. Mm-hmm. They have, he has to get a new contract. He could not play under it. All right. So with Brooks back and Kelsey back and Lane Johnson, Sam Allo left guard. And then obviously we talk about, this left tackle situation between Jordan Mailata and Andre Dillard. Andre Dillard has to be the most, uh, maybe most, maybe the least discussed first round pick on this team in the last five years. He's almost like, oh yeah, Andre Dillard's on this team. How about that? He was a first round pick who probably won't be the starter. I'm, I'm, I'm saying that now. I don't know. Yeah. You know. Well, mo- listen, it's it's <laughs> Mailata is the landslide favorite, right? Mm-hmm. But let you know, it would, be, it would be nice if Dillard has a great camp and it makes Jeff Stetland's decision on who should start tough. Which, right? Because it'll get out. Reporters will be they, they get we get full access at practice in July, mm-hmm. and we've got the three preseason games. And and at, and at worst, if Dillard is great and Mylotta wins the job, it gives it, the Eagles leverage in a trade if if it gets out that he had a great camp. So we'll see. Right. Right. Any other offensive line news and notes that uh... – uh, You know, Dickerson and what they're allowing him to do, he's doing yeah. well. I had heard that. Mm-hmm. Uh, Herbig, as we noted, uh, I don't know, f- uh, two weeks ago or something, he supposedly lost 30 pounds, uh, I was told. Yeah, so we that... should try to get for the next pod, just, you know, if we can, uh, you know, guys in what, what shape they showed up in. Um, if that's All right, possible. we'll check on it. Yeah, yeah sure, sure. That. You know, the, the – uh, Only we if have it's alarming, note. you know. I'm sorry. Only if it's like alarming, like if it's yeah, either, it's true. Like, That's know. a good point, right? No, the one that shocked us last summer, we had heard, and I saw it. I'm like, Derek Barnett looks small, like right. really small, right? And um, you know, we we uh, uh, Jason Avon said he was 215. I had heard he was 235, which is also small. Mm. But again, they're weighed every day, mm-hmm. so who who the heck knows? Maybe he maybe by the end of training camp or September he was he was 235. I, I can't remember now, but anyway. Sure. We'll check on that. But Herbig had to lose weight. He was severely overweight last season. Right. Um, so we'll see about that. We need to check on the Raven Clark when he'll be ready. I know he won't be ready till sometime in August, but is it going to be mid-August, late August? I don't have no idea. Right. So we, we need to find out here because he could be the swing tackle. If they want to move in Dillard, we'll, we'll see. That's They're going to need it because, boy, based on this team's injury history, and I still cannot understand. I've heard the staff is really good, this new medical staff. Mm-hmm. So I just don't understand the injuries with this team. <laughs> well, hopefully those things are start to change, obviously. Yep. Um, all right, so that'll, that'll kind of wrap up our OTA notes. We'll get into a little bit more on, um, you know, some free agents out there and some names that are, that are out there that are sparking fan interest. Uh, first, I want to remind everybody to check out our friends at phlsportsnation.com, enhancing the fans' experience with their coverage of all of our Philadelphia sports teams. I'm sure they're doing a great job with Sixers coverage right now. And uh, you can find them on Twitter at PHL Sports Nation. And uh, let's also pause real quick for a word from our other great sponsors, including our friends at Sky Motor Cars. All right, if you stop into Sky Motor Cars, make sure you tell them that Jeff and Adam sent you. You will get a great deal, phenomenal deal. And they need cars. They, they need, need cars. This, this, this story. Of, I don't know if you're aware of this. This uh, deal with the problem we're having in this country with the lack of available cars. No, it, I didn't realize. There's this sort of like because of COVID last year, mm-hmm. manufacturers were having. Pro- there's some could have sort of like microchip that's got to be in every car. Oh wow! And they could not mm-hmm. produce them in our country. So that's why rental cars are really expensive, and dealerships some dealers are having trouble getting cars well like the, having intro they don't have too much inventory they don't have enough so that's what as you said if you got a car and you want to sell it to them i actually sold uh, my wife and i sold two cars to sky motor cars two years ago mm-hmm. um we got one through them and they were gross again the easiest 
easiest car uh, deal in my life. My God, was it a pleasure. And, and read, read their, read their, their write-ups on Deal Raider. Or, or, uh, it's unbelievable. I, I remember a couple of years ago, I went through all of them and I just, it was almost like, are these real? Because these are so positive. I can't believe it. And guess what? They're all real. That's awesome. So, right here in our backyard in the Delaware yep. Valley, Westchester, yep. PA. All right, let's talk about the name that's biggest right now circulating around the league and, of sure. course, the Philadelphia Eagles, and that would be Julio Jones. Um, <laughs> I feel like as an Eagles reporter, Adam, I have been doing this specifically at this position. Hmm. This goes back to, like, Larry Fitzgerald. I'm sorry, Plexico Burst to <laughs> Larry Fitzgerald to Anquan Bolden to is probably oh uh, DeAndre Hopkins last year around this time I mean it's it never ends with well, the, they were involved in the Hopkins Hopkins thing that 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 was well, there that, you go I, and I, I'm I'm never saying that the, the Eagles are not involved in fact you know they almost traded for Larry Fitzgerald they, they almost did, did they I Larry Fitzgerald told me this to my face when I was Tell me what happened what, Arizona fresh, locker room fresh our memory I don't remember the story 2000 uh let's see Kevin Cobb's a, a Cardinal at the time so what year did he 11 2011 the Eagles play the Cardinals I flew out a little early to do a story on uh Cobb because I was I was working for NBC Philly and I'm walking around the locker room and Larry Fitzgerald says hey are you a reporter from Philly and I'm like, why, well, yes, I, I am. I'm like, wow, Larry Fitzgerald just comes up to me, right? Yeah. He's like, man, I remember the time I almost got traded to Philly. And he he, he starts to talk about how he was looking, um, researching uh, Tower, uh, Trump Tower and other places. In, was, was there a Trump Tower? In, in well, there's a Trump property on the river. Yeah, there was a Trump property. But he was he told me it was how he was researching properties and thinking that trade was going to ha- go through, and then it never happened. Wow. wow. I yeah. can't. I mean, I know Anquan Bolden. At one point, I had a report that they were putting out feelers to see what his value was, and they 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 tried to me to they tried me to the Cardinals wanted me to shoot. They wanted to shoot down what I put out there, but one of the teams told me that they were talking to Cardinals, so I knew it was true. Right. But anyway, I did not know that about Fitzgerald. Wow. Yeah. What? So I, I had this big scoop, that. and I called the people back at CSN. I'm like, you're never going to believe this. So I gave yeah. him a story, yeah. and then here's what happened. All right. The Eagles were also at that point. I mean, they are all the time. There was some kind of trade that maybe they were discussing internally. There's some report or something like okay. that, right? Okay. And somebody at Comcast, you know, who wants to put me on air after I get this yeah. uh, on TV, teases my segment by saying, and Jeff Mosher's got the latest on an Eagles trade. <laughs> Oh wow! So wow. what do you have on a trade? And I Can go, you well, you know, it was a trade that never happened. And right. I start going into it, and I had so many people hit me up on Twitter and my email, just killing me. I didn't make the decision to say that. Jeez, because <laughs> right now, well, speaking of that, so so if you put this out now, right uh, now, obviously Larry's probably going to retire, but he's he's certainly close to it. But let let's say that um, this is the height of Larry. Larry Fitzgerald's career on Twitter. Oh, dude, that you would have got roasted. But but again, you weren't. You just because Larry, you were just going with what Larry told you. It's fun. man, I don't even remember this. Holy yeah, shit. I don't know if I would have gotten. I mean, it, it was a trade that was talked about but never happened. So I mean, it's you know, no, no. But if was. you were oh. if you're saying it was going to happen, like if the, if the trade was like imminent oh, or something. Oh yeah, you know, yeah. Because no, no, this... the imminent stuff is like when you remember back, the fans were killing everyone. Um, including yours truly, but I didn't say it like other reporters did, where the Wentz trade should happen soon. Mm, yes. And then, and, oh, my fans were sick. Because you know, I get it. And we all were. But we had Wentz burnout with the trade to the yeah, Colts. It really only wound up taking a week longer than most yeah, people thought, I mean, but it felt like but, three years. Right, exactly. <laughs> and these things happen. What are you going to do? But yeah, uh, people are pissed off that Wentz, or Ertz has not been traded yet, or they want a resolution. I totally get it. Totally yeah, understand. But absolutely. it's interesting. I didn't know that about Yeah, Israel. Yeah. So back to Julio Jones. Yeah. I don't know how realistic this can be. I mean, he's 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 supposed to make what seventeen million. He's got fifteen million guaranteed, Adam. Yeah, it's with another 15, two next year. Yeah, it's fifteen point three million fully guaranteed. He's got three years left. Uh, the two million guaranteed next year is only guaranteed for injury. It turns uh, oh, okay. to the two million becomes fully guaranteed on the fifth day of free agency. So that's a that doesn't matter. So it's, it's really a one year structure. Um, the belief is going to be a second round pick if they trade him. Not they could they get a first. As one GM told me this week, the only way they're going to they're going to get a first is if they trade Julio and something else, mm. and then they'll get a first back. Why okay. would they not get a first? Fifteen point three million for the season. 
you might have to walk if, if he gets hurt again, you might walk away. Right. So you're going to pay him 15.3 million and give up a, a first round pick for a guy that only might be there one year. No, you can't do that. So, um, look, he, he went through a lot of injuries last year. Uh, what I was told by one team was that before he had a spate of injuries where not only did he miss seven games, he was limited at some other ones that he was active for. Mm-hmm. Uh, he looked good to, to start the season. Then he, it, it was really problematic with his hamstring. Just, it, uh, Right, groin and every it's soft tissue injuries, and you worry about this. At thirty two years old, is he is he on the downward slide? He might be. Yeah. Um, what I understand is the Eagles and Falcons have talked, but you know what? This is what I've learned about it. The Eagles are in every they they sometimes call up. Yep. They may not have any interest in the player. They want to know what are you asking for? What's the you know? They just want to get a right. It's good to to write stuff down, like to know what the market is for a. Player 32 years old at wide receiver who's going to be a Hall of Famer. That you right. know, um, right. I do think they have interest, but what I think is ultimately it won't happen or probably won't happen because A, the Eagles have a cap issue. B, mm-hmm. even if they're to seriously entertainment and entertain it, they got to sign their veterans. I don't know next week they'll get a cap rebate for the post June one designations on June 2nd, but they got to sign their rookies. Then you're going to take on 15.3 million. And I just don't see it happening. Plus, um, you still got Ertz on the roster. You're paying him a five. I mean, to me, wouldn't you want to move him somewhere? I mean, worse comes to worse, you can cut him. You don't have to. I mean, whether you I, cut him or trade him, you don't have to pay him that eight. I know, but, you know, but I'm telling bad, you, but... I'm telling you, I think he either gets traded or he's back. What? Why? Why would? Why would that happen? Because I, it seems like they're hell bent on get a compensatory pick for him. If if he, you know, again, you trade him, you get a draft pick. You, we're talking about Ertz here, or you keep them, you get a compensatory pick for 22 either way. You get a pick for next year, or you get a compensatory pick for next year either right. way. You know, because if you keep them, you get one, Ertz walks, or you trade them and get you get a pick for next year from the team you trade to. So we'll see. We'll see. But um, that's I, I call that counterintuitive a- to what the Eagles want to do and be going forward to keep Zach Ertz on their roster. I mean, he'd be a I don't heck know. Of a guy I'm just, to have, I, I'm, I'm, I'm to the point here. Yeah, I'm like with every report, I still think he gets moved. Uh huh. But just the fact that we, I'm telling you, the way it works before the draft and during the draft, there's tremendous urgency from the club that's looking to move a player to move him, A. And B, clubs have a need for a certain position are going to make that move and get that player. Like, right. you, there's, ve- we've had a couple trades after the draft. Those are rare. Now, again, the season doesn't start till September. Right. Does it mean if Ertz does not get traded over the next month, he won't get traded in August? We've mentioned the Ronald Darby trade, so I wouldn't rule anything out. Yeah. But I'm at the point with this thing. I can't rule anything out here. You just, it's just uh, been a very odd cat and mouse situation here with Ertz. I'm, I'm, uh, because I know how much the staff likes Goddard. You know, we've, we've talked about that a couple of times here. And you really don't want to pigeonhole them to 12 personnel again, because if Ertz is on the roster at 8.5 million, he's got to play. 100% 100% agree. Do we saw this with Alshon Jeffrey last year? Even that if you don't want a guy on the roster when you know, he's Bob, making so cool. a certain amount of dollars. Yep. And that's why I've said with the restructures that they've done this offseason, it's not about the cap space. The cap will go up, they'll have space. It's about what happens if a lot of these guys all of a sudden hit decline and right. you've got them making this money, you're going to you know play what? them, you know? You know what? They never should have bench, not bench, but they should not have. They they made a, and I don't. I'd have to get to the bottom of it. I don't. I, I don't know if it came from the front office, or Peterson, or um, Aaron Moorhead, or whatever. They never should have should have lessened Fulgham's role. That was a terrible mistake. Now, right. did they know that he would sort of not handle that regression in his role well? However, way he did that, no. I don't know that they would have known that. I mean, if they would have checked with Detroit, they would have found out what you and I had known about mm-hmm. how it didn't work. It didn't work out very well for him. Detroit, he had issues there too. Minor, mm-hmm. but uh, there's a reason why they cut him. Right. In fact, actually twice. The fact of the matter is here, they should have not have forced Jeffrey on the ro- on the field. That was a mistake. Period. End of story. I, I agree. I agree. And then you, you do worry about some of the guys that got, you know, lengthy restructures who have high cap figures this year, next year in some of the year after about what happens if they're just not the player that you think they are 
and they're making all this money. And then if you, you cut them, then you're accelerating all that money into next year's cap. So that oh, yeah, even though the cap went up, then you have to have a lot, another, a lot of dead money occupying it again. Yeah, we've so. been talking about this. We did the dead money show, the uh, contract show last June. And I, you, you hinted at it. I, I agree with you. We're going to have to do it again. We had yeah. fun. People kind of had a kick out of it. Mm -hmm. They had something like 15, 15 contracts with, uh, no, I'm sorry, it wasn't 15. It was, it was definitely double figures. Right. 15 with voidables. They weren't doing voidable years when Joe Banner was here. I, I understand why you're doing it. It gives you a chance to keep your roster, especially because the Eagles, as you, you pointed out a couple months ago, clearly felt that they were going to run it back. Mm -hmm. But it didn't work out, and now they're stuck with some of these, this dead money. for the few, Now, obviously, they have a terrible one with Wentz. Right. But the cap, if it goes up as much as most teams, including the Eagles, think it's going to go up at 23. They'll probably get away with it. Mm -hmm. But you don't want anyone to have to, you don't want to have to cut some of these veterans. We'll right. see. Right. And by the way, the NFL and NFLPA did agree oh, yeah. on a 2022 salary cap ceiling of, I believe the NFL network reported 208.2 million. But yeah. remember, that is the, that is the, it doesn't mean it's going to be 208.2. That just means that it's, that's the most it's going to Correct. be. Correct. And even if it is 208.2, that's that's a pretty good jump. I wouldn't call it seismic. I mean, that's probably where it should have been, I guess, if there was no pandemic and it had gone up in this past year. But um, yeah, it's it does it's not a, it's not going to cure anybody who has uh, cap problems. Correct. And I, then again, if it's 23, that it goes up significantly to 230 or whatever. Right. I remember talking to the NFLPA about it. Their projection back. I'm going to say in 2016, 2015 was that the cap would go up 10 million a year. And it pretty much has, except mm -hmm. unfortunately because of the pandemic, it didn't go up as much as they would have hoped. But uh, look, get, get, the Eagles are a good example of when the cap doesn't go as, up as much as you thought w w it should go up. And you and I have talked about this, boy, they, I don't blame them for it. They didn't know a pandemic was going to happen, but yeah, it put a wrench into their cap for the first time during Roseman's career. They actually have a cap problem. It's kind yeah. of crazy. Yeah. All right. Uh, other free agents. Uh, speaking of time, you know, I know you said that the, you know, teams have time. They don't have to make any moves now, but a guy like Steven Nelson being out there. What, yep. When's that going to, when's I would think next, week. next yeah, week. Yeah, I, I would on June 2nd. Well, the Falcons are screwed. They can't do anything. They, in fact, they can't even sign the rookies. They can't trade Jones until at least June 2nd. They right. can't take any acceleration. <laughs> uh, it's crazy. They have less than a million dollars. Mm -hmm. they, they they pulled an Eagles. They, well, they didn't do dummy. They just restructured just to get under the cap. Right. Stay under the cap, barely. So, um, yeah, Steven Nelson, my understanding in terms of the Eagles, they do have interest, as we've said many times. Uh, they will not be interested if he continues to want more than they're willing to pay. My sense is, and the Eagles are not the only team like this, most teams see him as a two to four, four million dollar player. Because of the Eagles' cap situation, while I do think they would like to sign him, if he came in at two or three million, they they probably would pursue. Mm -hmm. um, we'll see. I, I just my 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 intel from other teams is he wants a certain number because he sees himself as clearly as a starter, and he is. Mm -hmm. But he's not a number one corner. He's more of a number two or number three. That's the way the, the, that's the Eagles thing I've heard. Yeah, the other teams see him. So yeah. um, based on our intel, the Eagles certainly. If, are, are interested but it's not likely because of how much money he wants all right well i guess you're right after once once these june 1st uh passes and teams clear some money uh we'll, usually things start to heat up there are there any other players that are out there via either free agency trademark and anything that you could think of that could help the eagles yes all right so I, someone had asked me in our message board on facebook about jordan hicks and i, I said mm -hmm. i don't see it because of his injury history right i also meant Part of it is because of his salary. Well, I looked into this, and here's what I do know. First of all, I, I didn't – man, did he take a shave? He, his, that contract the Cardinals did, I give the agents credit or whoever was doing it then um, credit. Eight and a half million a year is ridiculous for him. I mean, just with his injury history. Right. He's a high-character guy. He just turned 30. He's a little bit older than I thought. But um, really talented player. We, we know that. But he's just not the same player he once was. But you know what? His base salary is only two million. Wow, two million dollars. Yeah, so he took a pay cut. Yeah, I would. Um, I'm just telling you, just the sense that I get. Keep an eye on this guy. He's. I know the Eagles probably would like to add another linebacker because right now, 
I know. Oh, look, they're 43 defense. They're probably going to be more of a 4 2 5. They'll, you know, we'll, we'll Kerrigan, we're going to talk about before we get out here in a minute. Mm-hmm. Um, you know, depending on how they use in particular, you know, for a particular game, they may change his role per game. Who knows? But um, TJ Edwards is strictly a first and second down linebacker. Avery's got to learn how to play strong side linebacker in the scheme. So does Osman. There are no locks to make the team. Mm-hmm. Sean Bradley's only special teams. Eric Wilson's definitely going to be a starter. Davion Taylor, who the heck knows? <laughs> Middleton, nice player last season. Great story. New coaching mm-hmm. staff. Right. So you tell me, who, who's who's playing other than Wilson? Who's definitely playing? I, you know, I would think Singleton's got, got a pretty I good think, shot by default. Think, he'll a, get a shot, yes. Yeah. Uh, um, I mean, I'd be surprised if it was cut or he just couldn't make this team. Right, I didn't say he's going to be cut, but I don't know that he'll be a starter. And, and Joe Bocci ball was cut. <laughs> yes, yes, he was climbing off right. waivers. Did you see that? Right. Yeah. Oh, was he? I didn't know. By the Bengals, I think. Yeah. And then, um, my God, the Bengals have like a glut of linebackers. It's surprising. And then Jacoby Stevens is there, you know, who's got to learn how to play linebacker this level. But I would say, look, you got one guy who's a definite Wilson is starting, and the other guy's Singletary, Singleton, probably. After that, they're all just, we'll see. I just, I, I don't think I've ever seen a case before where a player agreed to a pay cut. And then the team wound up getting rid of him anyway, trading well, him. Well, you like, know why? You usually agree to a pay cut to preserve your roster spot. Well, the funny thing is they uh, cut his pay uh-huh. severely. And then they drafted Zayvon Collins, which said – and they, they gave him permission to seek a trade. And um, Man, it kind of like – you know, if I'm him, I'm like, man, I should have never have taken a pay cut then, right? I mean, I would have seen if some team would trade for me and pick up my, my current number. Um. Yeah, but the good thing is it's very tradable. So here, here's here, here's his contract. This year he's only making two million. Okay, it is fully guaranteed, so you, you're not going to cut him if you trade for him. It's only two million to walk away from. But right, uh, he's got per game roster bonuses up to a million, so that's two million he definitely will make. Mm-hmm. The, the 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 and he's got two million in um, playing time incentives. Mm-hmm. So basically, he's going to make two to three million. Is, is, is most that's a very for a guy like. Uh, Jordan Hicks, who's um, turns 30 in, in uh, October, is very experienced. And Eagles obviously know him. The staff doesn't know him. Right. I'm not saying it's going to happen, but my sense is there's uh, th- there could be some ball rolling here by uh, the next couple weeks. We'll see. We don't know. We- we'll uh, I just get the senses that um, Cardinals are motivated to move him from uh, Cardinal mm-hmm. source, as we definitely know. And they know the Eagles drafted him. Right. You never know. Um, and the Eagles could use some help at linebacker, like always. Yeah, that's amazing. You know, the Cardinals, they made the playoffs last year, did they not? No, no. They mm-hmm. didn't. They had a good year with Kyler Murray, but now I, I can't remember if they were the – They were like around 500 or something. Yeah. And um, their defense improved, I felt, from the, oh, from two there, years ago. Let me tell you something. This this uh, this defense that they're going to have, I know we don't not exactly we talk about the Cardinals very much. They yeah, they were eight and eight. I was right last season, but yeah, um, Chandler Jones. Remember, he was hurt last season. He's back, right? Yeah, JJ yeah. Watt, who's oh, who's that's right. I forgot they got JJ Watt. That's right, right. Saban Collins and Isaiah Simmons at, at in, their thirty four inside linebacker. Yeah, that's some talent Mark, right there. Yeah, Marcus Golden is not bad. Zach Allen's been hurt a lot as a D lineman. Yeah, uh, Buda Baker's a stud. Right, he is. That's just funny that they had this defense that was growing, and then now, now, uh, um, Reddick, who was one of their better sack oh, yeah, guys, right. He's gone, Giants. and maybe Hicks. I mean, that would yeah. be very interesting. Yeah, yeah. So uh, they're very weak at corner, though. That's their their position. So uh, we'll see. We'll see on on um, Jordan Hicks. It's, it's something I'm keeping an eye on because I right. uh, just talking to Cardinal Source. I do, boy, it really sounds like they're just. I'm not saying we'll do anything, take a conditional seventh round pick, but mm-hmm. I don't think it would take much to acquire him. So look, linebacker, they need to help this Jonathan Gannon, their D coordinator, just yeah. help him get off to a good start and fortifying their linebacker group to get competition would not be a bad thing. No, nope, not at all. And, you know, obviously Kerrigan is going to play a little bit of linebacker there and and uh, at the strong side. So he he factors into the mix of the But games. yeah, let's talk about him before we get out of here. I, sure. I just get this feeling. Mm-hmm that he's going to have a much bigger role than I anticipated. I know we had said on uh, two shows ago, he's going to be more in the fourth DN. <laughs> he definitely is. That's that's for sure. Right. I just, you, you had pointed this out because based on your intel, you were talking about how they're going to move the front a little bit. Mm-hmm. Um, and we know that, that Gannon's going to run his version of, of Zimmer's defense. And every time a coordinator 
is a coordinator for the first time. They bring in a little bit of everywhere they've gone and what they do major part of one of the, de- the defenses they, they coached under, and then they say sprinkling on other stuff. Well, you got the Zimmer double a gap stuff, which is a stand up linebacker. Usually you could do with the defensive end. But right. Kerrigan's done both. He, he's done, but he's been more of an outside linebacker than a DN that that's for sure in his career. But mm-hmm. as you and I were talking off the air uh, before we started this, this, uh, this, this pod tonight or today, Kerrigan, I mean, the way that they're going to do it. And, and as you mentioned on Q and a, uh, uh, Quentin Michael really points this out very well. There's a lot you can do with this front and Kerrigan, when he's a stand-up linebacker as a, as an add-in defender in the box, it's like he's standing next to Brandon Graham or Derek Barnett. You're going to see that. You're going right. to see him standing up and he could still move. I was told he didn't really lost anything. He just got screwed by the uh, two first round picks. What are you going to do? Yeah, no, no, that makes sense. So when you say a bigger role, um, from a snap, seventy five percent. Yeah, staff, snap. But, uh, yeah. That's what I was going to get. At. I you could think? see fifty percent, forty five, fifty percent. Hmm. It'll be interesting to see how many snaps he gets compared to like Josh Sweat, you know, who plays a different Great position, question. but but I, just as a pass rusher. Yeah, but see, here's the thing, right? Mm-hmm. Let's say in nickel they stick because he's long and he's done it before. They play him inside. I know Graham's done it before, right? But let's say they move one of the, the now. Now, obviously, Hargrave and Cox could play in, in nickel. But let's say they want to give a breather to Hargrave, right? Right. So you stick Sweat in next to hit next to Cox, mm-hmm. and then you stand up Kerrigan. Yeah, I and mean, then this this thing could be pretty dynamic. The more that I that I think about it, and the more I've talked to people who are f- familiar with Kerrigan for free agency, mm-hmm. he hasn't really lost much. I mean, I know he turns thirty three, but this 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 could be a little bit better than I imagine. It's going to be a little bit. Um, again, I'm not saying he's going to play a ton, but in nickel. As a pass rusher, which is really what he could excel in, like you'd, you'd mentioned, I think you nailed it with um, Chris Long. Mm-hmm. What, why can't you have him that kind of role? Plus, you can move him. Yeah. No, I, th- I think that – look, I, I, th- I thought it was a really good signing, Ryan Kerrigan. And, I, th- I you know, I hope he stays healthy because I can see him having a pretty good impact there. And it gives them diversity up front in the pass rush, which is very important. Because they tend to have one type of guy. You know, uh, Brandon Graham's mostly a bull rusher. Fletcher Cox is mostly a bull rusher. Uh, Josh Sweat can edge you. I mean, but, you know, they needed a little, like, like when we got all fired up about Jannard Avery, it's because we got fired up because he had speed. He had something different. And, you know, Kerrigan, to be able to stand up and kind of come around the edge like that and play that multi-positional pennant pass rush role, Gives him something different, so that's a good thing. Make him think, and, and you yeah. make the the the, the uh, offensive coordinator think on the other team. Yep. Okay, where's Waldo? Where are you where are you lining him up? Yeah. Maybe Jernard Avery, if he by surprise makes the team, because mm-hmm. he that San Francisco game, man, holy smokes, he was shot out of a cannon. He was incredible. That game. Yeah, his well, one he's game. really done here. But that's true. That's true. It was his one game. His time to shine. All right, you know what? I'm I'm always amazed about our ability to just kind of turn the mics on twice a week and in, in the off season and just talk Eagles for almost an hour and a half. <laughs> it's, we talk about it's really six, fantastic. Sixers yeah, we have a little Sixers in there. And... Sorry, folks. I know some of you are annoyed that we talk and we we crowbar a couple of other sports in there. But come yeah, on, it's we got a little Andy Reid yeah. stories in there. Yeah, no. Well, no, they love that. But when we talk Sixers <laughs> or. What other nonsense we throw in there? We'll do wrestling next month. I know people keep asking me <laughs> to do it, and uh, I'll do it. I, I'm happy to. I, I, I it's funny because when people ask me in the on um, Twitch, mm-hmm. it makes me think of stuff I completely forgot about uh, wrestling when I picked up a Terry Funk. Right. Which is <laughs> we'd like to hear that story. My God, that was. Uh, uh, I can't wait. One of the best days of my life, other than meeting my wife, it was pretty. Just because he's like the, 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 this guy was like Hulk Hogan. Right. Uh-huh. Oh, I remember Terry Funk. Yeah. yeah, he's crazy, and he scared the hell out of me. What growing up as a kid, I thought he was. You know, I thought Russell was just five percent real. I thought he was really <laughs> like that, but he's actually a sweetheart of a guy. I'm getting better. So. Funny stuff. Yep. All right. So speaking of your Twitch, how do, now? If do you have to be a subscriber to Twitch? Yeah, you subscribe. Yeah, you subscribe to it. it. Doesn't cost you anything. But do you have it's to have your own Twitch channel, or can yeah, I? Yeah, I do. Go it's the, the, the Adam Kaplan go? Show. Right, okay. the Adam Kaplan Show, and you, yeah, and, and you could give me tips. I have to figure out how to do that to make money on this thing. <laughs> you want tips from? You see the comments we get on YouTube. You really want people giving you? No, tips? I know, no, no. But what I'm saying <laughs> is, no people. All right. Because the great thing is it's rapid fire. Now, what I'm trying to do, and I have to look at how to do this, because I'm new to this technology, uh-huh. is how to get sound so we all could talk to each other. Gotcha. Because what they're doing is they type it. It's like a chat. You type it in your question. 
Uh-huh. And I feel like I want to go back and forth. I want to, I want to get opinions. And well, like I, we do polls and I will ask opinion. Like, well, I ask people, why do you got, why do some people like YouTube on our, I was talking about our pod inside the birds. Why do some people like YouTube of watching us mm-hmm. instead of listening to us? I find it fascinating. I am fascinated by that as well. Uh, I think it is yeah. interesting. All right. So the Adam Kaplan show on Twitch. Right? And, right? and tell us about uh, Powder Blue. Powder Blue Podcast. It's my Phillies podcast that I do with Frank Close and Susie Hunter. And um, we we took this weekend off because Frank's uh, out. He's in Clearwater, actually. Oh. And um, honestly, if we did one this week, it would probably be a whole lot of doom and gloom anyway. So although I guess the last two nights have been better. Um, but yeah, we'll, we'll regroup next week and hopefully have some better things to speak about. Because I'm not sure I'm ready to live in a world where my best starter is Vince Velasquez and I'm trusting Hector Can you Neris. Believe it though, Colvin. he's it would be like uh it would uh, this is gonna sound funny. It'd be like JJ Ortega Whiteside becoming a player. The, no, it'd be like him being their best wide receiver. Well right? that's even crazier. <laughs> right. Right. But no, but look and look, he's the guy's a second round pick, Ortega Whiteside, but there, there's been nothing to show that he's ever gonna make it. But right things have happened but yeah the Phillies have been Joe before we get out of here Joe Girardi I was such a fan of his before he became manager mm-hmm. I'm really been underwhelmed and we talked about this the last show I, I don't quite understand what's going on with him yeah that's the big thing I'm, I'm surprised by how underwhelmed I am so it's a long summer hopefully things turn around that'll do it for this edition of Inside the Birds the leading podcast in Eagles Intel big thanks of course to our producer Hunter Brody check out his work on his youtube channel it's called sports talk with broads find him on twitter at broads 81 and at broads media and as always we thank you all of you for flying with us inside the birds